huge favor. Can you put whatever you have in your hand down and clap your hands and give the Lord the greatest shout you can give him? I said the greatest shout you can give him. On your way down, just elbow three people next to you and say, I make history, I make history. Unless you got hand sanitizer, but if you don't, just elbow somebody. <laughs> I promise you, you ain't gonna get no coronavirus. <laughs> Hallelujah. History is recorded, is the recorded story of those who fight for the future daily. And those who are dedicated to tomorrow's narratives, people speak about after they're gone. So decision makers and risk takers make history. Repeat that to me. Decision makers and risk takers make history. Before we get into this text, it's difficult to really explain or expound upon this text without looking at Numbers chapter 13. So we can jump into Joshua, but our understanding the backstory will not make a lot of sense to you. So let's do some historical background work. Number one, God promises Israel a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And it's a promised land. Shout promised land. And Moses sends out 12 spies. And from the 12 spies, 10 came back with an evil report. But only two came back with a good report. Inspecting the land is what he told him to do. Fortify, see what, see what kind of cities are fortified, the inhabitants, and the possible challenges that they would face going into Canaan. And when they came back after 40 days of investigating and checking on the city and looking at their competition, they realized, two of them realized that we can do this, but 10 came back with an even report. They came back with fruit, literally had uh, grapes the size of people's heads. Uh, walking <laughs> out, of the, out of Canaan back into the wilderness with proof that this thing is flowing with milk and honey and that it does have produce that we can enjoy. And still, 10 came back with an evil report. Two came back with a good report, Joshua and Caleb, that knew that we could do this. And so the others said, we are like grasshoppers in our own sight, and we are also like grasshoppers in their sight. Even though these people had never seen them, this is how they assumed they would be considered in the eyesight of those who are possessing their land. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me tell you something real quick. One of the greatest threats to your potential is seeing yourself through the lens of your own turbulent history. What made this challenging here is because the children of Israel are literally dealing with the drama and the trauma of what they come from. I think we give them a we we sometimes give them a difficult uh, rap because we do not understand in full context how they became as turbulent as they became. Literally, the last 400 years of their story, they have been enslaved, they have been browbeaten, they have been they have been dependent upon a government system. And these people are depending upon the system, Pharaoh's system, and because they've been browbeaten for so long, their self-esteem, their consciousness about themselves, their self-awareness about themselves is low. Because of these people have been under such chaos and such drama for 400 years, they have been passed down oppression. So by the time they move into a place of freedom, it's difficult for them to believe that they can conquer something even with God's help. It is true because many of us have been in cycles so long that our historical context has been so messed up so long that even though God is performing miracles, signs, and wonders, he's blessing us, he's increasing us, he's expanding us, he's expanding our network and our bandwidth and our intelligence and the grace and the anointing and the power and the mantle upon our lives because we haven't broke up with our historical past, it's difficult to see God move us into a future context because we we're still dealing with the drama of yesterday. You can be saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, and still be in the trauma of last year, of last season, of three and four generations of craziness. And so, literally, they are, they are their worst enemy because they see themselves through the lens of a turbulent past. Lay your hands on yourself real quick and shout this out to me. God, deliver me. Deliver my mind and my heart from historical bondage. Can I tell you why? Because in this season, you can't afford to hold yourself hostage to historical bondage. 
Let me tell you something. You're not as weak as you used to be. You're not as emotional as you used to be. You're not as helpless as you used to be. You're not as passive as you used to be. You're not as feeble as you used to be. You're not easily manipulated like you used to be. You can't be tricked as much as you used to be. You don't fall for the same tricks and inboxes like you used to. You don't need as much approval as you used to need. You're not as easily offended as you used to be. The days of you dumbing down your potential to make other people feel comfortable about where you're going have come to an end. Look at your name and say, I'm coming into myself and I'm feeling pretty good about how I feel about myself. God has literally, he, listen, he did not put his hands on you to keep you in the same emotional trauma of... You got to get past 10 year old scars at some point. It's time for you to let the word of God mature you past your emotional, your emotional histories. Let me tell you something else. Quit dumbing down who you are to make insecure people feel good about where they are. You got to quit acting like you don't know who you are. That's called false humility. It is false humility to know that God's hand is on your life and still operate as if it's so. He has never touched you. No, the devil is alive. Those days are coming to an end. I believe I'm standing in a room with a bunch of people that God is bringing you into the best days. And if anybody got a problem with what you're coming into, God's about to remove them or let them become a tutor so they can get to... Tell three people around you, I know who I am. Shout out with me. I'm gifted. I am responsible. I am strong. I am powerful. Tell somebody else, you is kind. You is smart. And you is important. Tell somebody else, you is kind. (laughs) You is smart. And you is important. I need you to say it again. You is kind. You is smart. And you is important. Yeah. You say, well, that's bad English. Watch a movie. I got 18 minutes. I'm done. So in Numbers 13, God has literally sent them out to, to investigate what they're about to come into. To show them Canaan. To show them the promise. To show them where they are on their way to. What they are about to inherit with his help. But in Numbers 14... Moses begins to pray. Watch this. In verse 18, it says this. So Numbers 14, verse 18. The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. Watch this. Forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Look at verse 19. Pardon, I pray. Here it is. The iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your loving kindness just as you also have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. So Moses changed his mind. And God said, so the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. But indeed, here it is, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. Here's the power of intercession. When the right person prays, family lineages shift. Because prayer can, or intercession can shift trajectories, but it may not shift consequences. Israel has been prayed for. Moses is interceding for them. That the generational schemes, iniquities, the things that are visited upon the third and the fourth, that God would forgive it according to his loving kindness. God chooses to do so, but also said, but there are going to be some consequences for those who, I will forgive you. And I'll deal with that, but there are some consequences. Here's the hard truth. You ready for this? Separating you from a generational scheme does not qualify you for Canaan. You can be forgiven and still wonder. My fear for our generation is this, is that we're becoming free from cycles, but bound to circles. So now we're free. I'm not connected, hallelujah, to the third and fourth generational scheme. But I'm still in this wild place for 40 years 
a trip that was supposed to take 40 days. They're disconnected from the ancestral scheme, but still wandering. You can be speaking in tongues and still be in a circle. 40 years of being cut off from that part, but still not making any progress. 40 years. 40 years celebrating coming out of Egypt. 40 years celebrating how Pharaoh and his army were drowned. 40 years of seeing the hand of God. And here's the thing. God is so kind. He'll still give you the cloud by day, the fire by night, and manna while you're still walking in circles. Can I tell you something, beloved? There's nothing worse than a free wanderer. Worship and wonder. Praise and wonder. Not signs and wonder. Fasting and wandering. Speaking in tongues and wandering. Preaching and wandering. Singing and wandering. Y'all quiet. Leading and wandering. Governing and wandering. So now they come to the end of their journey. Let me recap. Moses dies. Joshua becomes the leader. After 30 days of mourning, Joshua takes the sons and daughters of those who died in the wilderness, who were wandering in the wilderness, and he brings them to the brinks of the promised land of the Jordan. And only Joshua and Caleb are the only two that survived this whole time, please. So now Israel moves into Canaan. They're defeating kings. They're burning cities. They're putting their foots on the necks of those who are occupying Canaan. But watch this. After 31 battles, shout 31. 31. After 31 battles, Caleb now has a conversation. And if you're a preacher, a real good preacher, you understand that everything in the text means something. There's a reason why the Bible shows us the number 31. Can I tell you something about 31? I found out through the Gematria that 31 is the number of God. It literally is the number of L. There's two words here that makes up this word 31. It's the word Lamed. Lamed is the number 30 in the Hebrew alphabet, but it's also the word Aleph, which is one. 31. 31 is the number of God. It's the number of L. As a matter of fact, things begin when God shows up. Uh, 31 is the number, watch this, is the number of years after Christ's death that the gospel was preached throughout the known world. 31. 31 times Moses' name is mentioned in the entire Holy Writ. In the Exodus alone, 31. 31. Shout 31. 31. 31 is a significant number because it is the number of God. It's the number of the presence of God. The number of God showing up. Shout 31. And at 31, after 31 battles, 31 kings being defeated, 31 different entities that they fought, Joshua is speaking to Caleb, and Caleb rises up and says this. He says, listen, verse 7, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought word back to him as it was in my heart. Here's the thing. God sends him with the other 11 To spy out the land. Can I tell you something? There's a season that God will allow you to see what he wants you to have. But there's a difference between that season and the season you come into when he's ready for you to fight for it. It took 45 years to get Caleb ready to take what he knew he could take 45 years previous. Verse 8. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up. With me made the heart of the people melt with fear, but I followed the Lord my God fully. Verse 9. So Moses swore on that day, surely the land on which your foot has trodden will be an inheritance to you and to your children forever. Because you have followed the Lord my God fully. Verse 10. Now behold, the Lord has let me live. Shout that with me. Let me live. Say it it again. He let me live. He let me survive long enough to get to this point. There is a revelation here. Listen, until you come into the thing that God wants you to have, he will extend your time period to get to that place. That's why you don't have to be fearing death. Because until you come into the very thing that God has promised you, he will let you live. See, there's certain car accidents that couldn't take you out because you hadn't come into your why yet. There's certain bullets that flew right past your head. You know why they didn't hit you? Because you hadn't come into your time yet. There's certain relationships that you didn't catch a disease from. You know why? Because you didn't come into your time yet. He let him live. 
You let him live just as he spoke these 45 years and from the time that the Lord spoke to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness and now behold, look at verse 11. I am still as strong today as I was in the day Moses sent me. Here it is. As my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and for coming in. Can I tell you something? Just because you missed an opportunity in a previous season doesn't mean God changed his mind about you having it. There is no such thing as an expiration day for the will of God over your life. God will never negotiate his will. And his will doesn't have a time stamp. Listen, if you didn't come into it in this season, hold on. God's going to bring that thing back to you because if it's in the will of God for you to have it. Somebody shout, give me this mountain, give me this mountain. Give me this hill country, give me this hill country. Look at verse 12. Now then, give me this hill country, Caleb says. About which the Lord spoke on that day, for you heard on that day that Anakim were there. I got nine minutes to deal with this. With great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. Now that brings me to where I want to get to. Anakim. Anakim. These are literally the giants, the descendants of Nephilim. The Nephilim are those who the angels, the sons of God had literally came to the earth and found women to be attractive. They are, but... (laughs) But these angels literally decided we're going to have relationships with these women. We're going to go into these women, and they had children. And these children were like giants. And so we know them as Nephilim, and the descendants of Nephilim are the Anakim, right? Here's the thing about this. There's two things I want you to write down. Number one is this. In Canaan or in the promise and in your promise, in what God has called us to do in order for you to make history, there are going to be two things you're going to have to deal with. Number one, an intimidating presence. The Bible says the Anakim were giants. This is why the children of Israel, because of their drama, some of them, because they had not resolved what they had always seen, had automatically assumed we can't take them. It's too big for us. But you see the size of their heads? Did you see how big their hands were? Did you see how long their necks were? Did you see how fast they were running? Did you see the strength that they had in their legs? Did you see how strong they were? We, there's, no way we can, there's no way we can overtake that. It reminds us too much of the scar tissue that we had with Pharaoh's people. It, it, it's too familiar. It's too, it's too many of them. There's no way we can take this. I know God has parted the Red Sea. I know God has, has literally fed us food out of nowhere. I know the Father has allowed us to literally wipe out our enemies in the wilderness. But that's the wilderness. And, the, and Canaan is something we've never seen before. And, and, so now, and so now the intimidating presence is something you're always going to have to deal with when you're coming into your own. When you're coming into your Canaan, there's going to be an intimidating presence. There's going to be people that are smarter than you, people that are faster than you, people that think quicker than you. There's going to be a system that's going to try to overthrow you. There's going to be some type of demonic power, a presence, or spirit that's going to try to intimidate you for coming out of, uh, coming out of debt, coming out of poverty, coming out of, out of, out of emotional issues, coming out of, of, of head trauma. Trauma, coming out of emotional trauma, coming out of bad relationship. There's always going to be something that tries to intimidate you to keep you from coming into your own. And Caleb said, you know what? I don't care about that. But the other thing he had to deal with, and the Lord showed me this last night, this is powerful. Anak did not just mean giant. As a matter of fact, in the Hebrew, child it does not mean giant at all. One of the easy translations if you got it out of a Vines expository, you got it out of a Strongson Quarters, the easy translation is to show you that it means long neck. But in the Chaldee, the Chaldee language, the Chaldee dialect of the Hebrew dialect, it literally does not just mean long neck. The literal translation in its antiquity is a collar. A collar. It literally means in the Chaldee, it has the ability to choke, to control, to manipulate and to silence. And whenever, slow down, whenever people are coming into a place where you're literally about to make history, you got to know that there will be an intimidating presence, but there will also be something to come around your neck to try to keep you from becoming, to choke you, to control your direction, 
to me. See, listen, listen. When you got a collar on, the person who put the collar on you has authority over you. That person is the person that has the ability to control where you would go. They can steer you in what direction. They can show exactly how far you can go. It also shows ownership. And the Anakim is like, Hebron belongs to us. It's this, 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 this area belongs to us. But Caleb has this perspective. No, no. Give me the hill country. Because 45 years ago, God sent me to Hebron. Moses told me to go. We went to Hebron. We looked over into the valley and saw the Anakim. And I believe then that I can take them. And I started thinking about that thing. What is, why, would, why would Caleb and Joshua, I understand Joshua, Hosea, whose name got changed to Joshua. I understand, I understand Joshua. But why Caleb? Why, why, why Caleb? What is it about Caleb that, that makes him so, so listen, Joshua and them have went in. They have already fought. And, and now Caleb's like, yeah, I know we, we, we've killed everybody at the battle of IE. We wiped these people out, the Amorites, the Hivites, Jebusites, your mamaites. We took care of all these ites. But now we're at a place where I still got an unresolved mountain. We fought all these other fights. But I still got a bone to pick about the one that belongs to me. See, you and I have come into a lot of battles and we won. But there are some battles I still got a bone with. And so now Caleb is now frustrated because he's trying to... listen. Uh, we've now settled. You've given out allotments to these people, and, and you've given out allotments to, to Reuben and to, to Gad and to, to Simeon. You've given out uh, allotments here. You've given out allotments there. But I want this hill country. And he didn't just bring anybody. He brought the tribe of which he come from, Judah. They came with a delegation, and they spoke to Joshua. And then the Lord began to deal with me last night about this. Why did he? Why was he so focused on the collar? Until I just, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Because Caleb's name literally means dog. If there's anything that understands. What it feels like to be manipulated and controlled. Surely. Say, elbow your name and say, it's the dog, it's the dog. And every dog has a moment where it wants to set itself free from what's been asphyxiating its neck. (laughs) I believe I'm in a room with a whole bunch of dogs, no disrespect. But in this season, you got to be like Caleb. I am willing to come after everything that's been trying to control my speech, control my direction, control and manipulate my processes, what God is bringing me to. Give me this mountain so I can take authority over everything that's been trying to take authority over my life. In this season, you're going to have to be confrontational. This is not a season for us, hallelujah, all nations. This is not a season for us to be a people who are passive. This is a season for you to be straightforward about what you believe. Give me this mountain. What is that mountain? It may look like death free for you. It may look like a whole new situation. I don't know what it looks like for you. But whatever it looks like, give me this mountain and everything that's standing in my promise. Am I going to let nothing choke me? Am I going to let nothing control and alter my direction I don't care who he or she is even if it's myself in this season I refuse to let something stay around my neck you know the Bible says that Caleb drove them out (laughs) I like that phrase drive them out because it, it flips it flips control in the opposite direction What was, see, the collar would drive you, (laughs) but in this case, they were driving it. And I love it because the scripture says when they came in, they would burn the cities down. They burn the cities down because they didn't want any resemblance of what used to be. Lift your hands, let me pray for this over you. I got 58 seconds. Father, let us be like Caleb in this season. 
I believe I'm in a room with some history makers in the making. Whew. Just like last week we talked about decisions. Hallelujah. I'm declaring over you. Hallelujah. That this will be a relentless season for you. That you won't let up until you're standing on the necks of the things that were standing over your neck. Hallelujah. And I hate this thing of poverty that I feel that's always around God's people in this region. And we just thinking that the back of that is being broken. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, glory to God. The back of that is being shattered in this room. That we should, hey. I feel, I feel a Caleb Grace coming into the room for people to become relentless to the glory of God. Somebody shout it with me. Give me my mountain. Shout it again. Give me my mountain. I will not be intimidated in this season by what's standing in my valley, what's standing in my hill country. But this shall be a season of aggression. I decree and I declare that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent people apprehended by force. And I thank you that a violent grace is falling into this room. Come on, pray. I thank you for a violent grace falling into this room to the glory of God that your people are being armed for the kingdom of God. Your people are being armed for dominion. I release dominion. The grace of dominion. The posture of dominion. The mindset of dominion. The system of dominion. The strategy of dominion over the people of God. If you believe it, shout about it. I said if you believe it, shout about it. If you believe it, shout about it. Touch three people around you say, give me my hill country. Give me my hill country. I'm going after every Anakim spirit in my line age, in my future, in my tomorrow. As a matter of fact, when you win in this season, it's impacting your kids. The Bible declares that when Caleb went in, he gave the land to his descendants. This victory is bigger than you. This victory is for the unborn. Will you shout for the unborn? Yeah. It's for people you may never... It's for people you may never see. It's for people you may never encounter. Yeah. Yeah, Manda Rebando. I hear the Caleb Grace. I hear the Caleb Grace. Give me my mountain. Give me my mountain. Give me my business. Give me my school. Give me this mountain. Yeah. the aggression of heaven yeah yep this is for your family this is for your children I'll make history I will make history I will make history I am a history maker I am I am Now give the Lord the greatest shot you can give him in the house. Somebody shot it. Give me my mountain. Give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. I will not be defeated. I will not be denied. I will not be stopped. I will not be assailed. This is my mountain season. This is my mountain season. And I shall declare and I shall speak to this mountain and it shall move by the power. Move mountain. Move mountain. Move mountain. Yeah. Let's shot again. Come on. Give me 